Chapter Thirteen of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Thirteen, The Return of Charlie Dixon. Oh, Uncle Joe, Charlie's back, and he's going to take us out tonight, and I'm so happy. Bindle regarded the flushed and radiant face of Millie Hearty who had just rushed up to him and now stood holding on to his arm with both hands i thought i should catch you as you were going home she cried uncle joe i i think i want to cry well remarked bindle if you'll give your poor old uncle a chance to get a word in edgeways he'd like to ask you why you wants to cry because i'm so happy cried millie dancing along beside him her hands still clasping his arm i see replied bindle dryly still it's a funny sort of reason for wantin to cry millikins and he squeezed against his side the arm she had now slipped through his you will come uncle joe won't you there was eager entreaty in her voice we shall be at putney bridge at seven i'm afraid i can't to-night millikins replied bindle i got a job on oh uncle joe the disappointment in millie's voice was too obvious to need the confirmation of the sudden downward droop of the corners of her pretty mouth you must come and bindle saw a hint of tears in the moisture that gathered in her eyes he coughed and blew his nose vigorously before replying you young love-birds won't miss me he remarked rather lamely but we shan't go unless you do said millie with an air of decision that was sweet to bindle's ears and i've been so looking forward to it oh uncle joe can't you really manage it just to please me bindle looked into the pleading face turned eagerly towards him at the parted lips ready to smile or to pout their disappointment and in a flash he realized the blank in his own life perhaps his nibs might like to have you all to himself for once he suggested tentatively there ain't much chance with a gal for another cove when your uncle joe's about millie laughed why it was charlie who sent me to ask you and to say if you couldn't come to-night we would put it off oh do come uncle joe charlie's going to take us to dinner at the universal cafe and they've got a band and oh it will be lovely just having you two well began bindle but discovering a slight huskiness in his voice he coughed again loudly seem to have caught cold he muttered then added of course i might be able to put that job orf but don't you want to come uncle joe asked millie anxiety in her voice want to come repeated bindle of course i want to come but well i wanted to be sure you wasn't just askin me because you thought it ud please your old uncle he concluded somewhat lamely oh uncle joe cried millie how could you think anything so dreadful why wasn't it you who gave me charlie bindle looked curiously at her he was always discovering in his niece naive little touches that betokened the dawn of womanhood ain't we becoming a woman millikins he cried whereat millie blushed thank you so much for promising to come she cried seven o'clock at putney bridge station don't be late and don't forget she cried and with a nod and a smile she was gone bindle watched her neat little figure as she tripped away at the corner she turned and waved her hand to him then disappeared now i don't remember promising nothing he muttered ain't that just millikins all over a twistin her poor old uncle round her little finger fancy artie havin a gal like that he turned in the direction of fenton street it's like an old inn havin a canary funny place evan he remarked shaking his head dolefully they may make marriages there but they make bloomers as well at five minutes to seven bindle was at putney bridge station makes me feel like five pound a week he murmured looking down at his well-cut blue suit terminating in patent boots the result of his historical visit to lord windover's tailor a pair of yellow gloves and an art at ud make a duke out of a drain man hello general he cried as sergeant charles dixon entered the station with a more than ever radiant millie clinging to his arm ere steady now young feller cautioned bindle as he hesitatingly extended his hand no pinchin charlie dixon laughed the heartiness of his grip was notorious among his friends i'm far too glad to see you to want to hurt you uncle joe he said uncle joe exclaimed bindle in surprise uncle joe i told him to uncle joe explained millie you see she added with a wise air of possession 
you belong to us both now what o remarked bindle goin goin gone and cheap at half the price ere no you don't by a dexterous dive he anticipated charlie dixon's movement towards the ticket window a moment later he returned with three white tickets oh uncle joe cried millie in awe you've booked first class we're a first class party to-night ain't we charlie was bindle's only comment as the two lovers walked up the stairs leading to the up platform bindle found it difficult to recognize in sergeant charles dixon the youth millie had introduced to him two years previously at the cinema wonder what artie thinks of him now muttered bindle filled out he has wonderful what the army can do for a feller he continued regretfully thinking of the various veins that had debarred him from the life of a soldier well millikins he cried as they stood waiting for the train and what do you think of his nibs i think he's lovely uncle joe said millie blushing and nestling closer to her lover not much chance for your old uncle now eh there was a note of simulated regret in bindle's voice oh uncle joe she cried releasing charlie dixon's arm to clasp with both hands that of bindle oh uncle joe there was an entreaty in her look and distress in her voice you don't think that do you really bindle's reassurances were interrupted by the arrival of the train millie became very silent as if awed by the unaccustomed splendour of travelling in a first-class compartment with a first-class ticket she had with her the two heroes of her valhalla and womanlike she was content to worship in silence as bindle and charlie dixon discussed the war she glanced from one to the other then with a slight contraction of her eyes she sighed her happiness to millie hearty the world that evening had become transformed into a place of roses and of honey if life held a thorn she was not conscious of it for her there was no yesterday and there would be no to-morrow my ain't we a little mouse cried bindle as they passed down the moving stairway at earl's court oh uncle joe i'm so happy she cried giving his arm that affectionate squeeze with both her hands that never failed to thrill him please go on talking to charlie i love to hear you and think now i wonder what she's thinking about bindle muttered right o millikins he said aloud you got two young men to-night and you needn't be afraid of em scrappin as they entered the universal cafe with its brilliant lights and gaily chattering groups of diners millie caught her breath to her it seemed a nirvana brought up in the narrow circle of mr hardy's theological limitations she saw in the long dining-room a gilded palace of sin against which mr hardy pronounced his anathemas as they stood waiting for a vacant table she gazed about her eagerly how wonderful it would be to eat whilst the band was playing and playing such music it made her want to dance many glances of admiration were cast at the young girl who with flushed cheeks and parted lips was drinking in a scene which to them was as familiar as their own fingernails when at last a table was obtained due to the zeal of a susceptible young superintendent and she heard charlie dixon order the three and sixpenny dinner for all she seemed to have reached the pinnacle of wonder but when charlie dixon demanded the wine list and ordered a bottle of number sixty eight the pinnacle broke into a thousand scintillating flashes of light she was ignorant of the fact that charlie was as blissfully unaware as she of what number sixty eight was and that he was praying fervently that it would prove to be something drinkable some wines were abominably sour i've ordered the dinner i suppose that'll do he remarked with a man of the world air millie smiled her acquiescence bindle not to be outdone in savoir faire picked up the menu and regarded it with wrinkled brow well charlie he remarked at length it's beyond me i suppose it's all right but it might be the german for cat and dog for all i know i opes he added anxiously there ain't none of them long white sticks with green tops what's always trying to kiss their tails them things does me asparagus cried millie proud of her knowledge i love it i ain't nothing against it said bindle recalling his experience at oxford if they didn't expect you to suck it like a sugar stick you wants a mouth as big as a dustbin if you're a-going to catch the end when the wine arrived charlie dixon breathed a sigh of relief as he recognized in its foam and amber an old friend with which he had become acquainted in france oh what is it cried millie clasping her hands in excitement champagne said charlie dixon oh charlie cried millie gazing at her lover in proud wonder isn't it isn't it most awfully expensive charlie dixon laughed 
Bindle looked at him quizzically. "'Ain't he a knockout?' he cried. "'Might be a duke a orderin' champagne as if it was lemonade, or a porth and a penworth.' "'But ought I to drink it, Uncle Joe?' questioned Millie doubtfully, looking at the bubbles rising through the amber liquid. "'If you wants to be temperance, you didn't ought to—' "'I don't, Uncle Joe,' interrupted Millie eagerly. "'But father—' "'That ain't nothing to do with it,' replied Bindle. "'You're grown up now, Millikins, and you got to decide things for yourself.' and Millie Hearty drank champagne for the first time. When coffee arrived, Charlie Dixon, who had been singularly quiet during the meal, exploded his mind. It came about as the result of Bindle's inquiry as to how long his leave would last. Ten days,' he replied, "'and—and and I want—' he paused hesitatingly. "'Out with it, young feller,' demanded Bindle. "'What is it that you wants?' "'I want Millie to marry me before I go back.' The words came out with a rush. Millie looked at Charlie Dixon, wide-eyed with astonishment. Then, as she realized what it really was he asked, the blood flamed to her cheeks, and she cast down her eyes. "'Oh, but I couldn't, Charlie. Father wouldn't let me, and—and—' and... Bindle looked at Charlie Dixon. "'Millie, you will, won't you, dear?' said Charlie Dixon. "'I've got to go back in ten days, and—and—' and... "'Oh, Charlie, I—I—' I... began Millie, then her voice broke. "'Look here, you kids,' broke in Bindle. "'It ain't no good you two settin' a stutterin' there like a couple of machine guns. "'You know right enough that you both want to get married, "'that you was made for each other, "'that you been lying awake o' nights wonderin' when you'd have the pluck to tell each other so, "'and here you are.' He broke off. "'Now look here, Millikins, do you want to marry Charlie Dixon?' Millie's wide-open eyes contracted into a smile. "'Yes, Uncle Joe, please,' she answered demurely. "'Now, Charlie, do you want to marry Millikins?' demanded Bindle. "'Rather,' responded Charlie Dixon, with alacrity. "'Then what you want to make all this bloomin' fuss about?' demanded Bindle. "'But it's so little time,' protested Millie, blushing. "'So much the better,' said Bindle practically. "'You can't change your minds. "'You see, Millikins, if you wait too long, Charlie may meet someone he likes better, "'or you may see a cove what takes your fancy more.' The lovers exchanged glances and meaning smiles. "'Oh, yes, I understand all about that,' said Bindle knowingly. "'You're very clever, ain't you, you two kids? You know everything there is to be known about weddings and lovin' and all the rest of it. Now look here, Millikins, are you going to send this ear boy back to France unhappy?' "'Oh, Uncle Joe!' quavered Millie. "'Well, you say you want to marry him, and he wants to marry you. If you don't marry him before he goes back to the front, he'll be unhappy, won't you, Charlie?' "'It'll be rotten,' said Charlie Dixon, with conviction. "'There you are, Millikins. How's he going to beat the Kaiser if he's miserable? Now what's up against you to beat the Kaiser by marrying Charlie Dixon? Are you going to do it, or are you not?' They both laughed. Bindle was irresistible to them. "'It's a question of patriotism. If you can't buy war bonds, marry Charlie Dixon, and do the old Kaiser in.' "'But father, Uncle Joe,' protested Millie, "'what will he say?' arty responded bindle with conviction we'll say about all the most unpleasant and uncomfortable things what any man can think of but you leave him to me there was a grim note in his voice which caused charlie dixon to look at him curiously i ain't been your daddy's brother-in-law for nineteen years without knowin' how to manage him millikins bindle continued now you be a good gal and go home and ask him if you can marry charlie dixon at once oh but i can't uncle joe Millie protested. I simply can't. Father can be... She broke off. Very well, then, remarked Bindle resignedly. The Germans will beat us. Millie smiled in spite of herself. I'll, I'll try, Uncle Joe, she conceded. Now look here, Millikins. You goes home tonight, and you says to that happy hearted old dad of yours, Father, I'm going to marry Charlie Dixon next Tuesday, or whatever day you fix. He'll say you ain't going to do no such thing. Millie nodded her head in agreement. Well, continued Bindle, what you'll say is, I won't marry no one else, and I'm going to marry Charlie Dixon. Then you just nips round to Fenton Street and leaves the rest to me. If you two kids ain't married on the day what you fix on, then I'll eat my at. Yes, the one I'm wearin' and the concertina, that I got at home. Eat 'em both, I will. Millie and Charlie Dixon looked at Bindle admiringly. You are wonderful, Uncle Joe, she said. Then turning to Charlie Dixon, she asked, what should we have done charlie if we hadn't had uncle joe charlie dixon shook his head the question was beyond him we shall never be able to thank you uncle joe said millie 
you'll thank me by being just as happy as you know how and if ever you wants to scrap you'll kiss and make it up ain't that right charlie charlie dixon nodded his head violently he was too busily occupied gazing into millie's eyes to pay much attention to the question asked him oh you are a darling uncle joe said millie then with a sigh she added i wish i could give every girl an uncle joe well now we must be orf here's the band to goin home and they'll be puttin the lights out soon said bindle as charlie dixon called for his bill as they said good night at earl's court station charlie dixon going on to hammersmith millie whispered to him it's been such a wonderful evening charlie dear then rather dreamily she added the most wonderful evening i've ever known good-bye darling i'll write to-morrow and you will millie inquired charlie dixon eagerly she turned away towards the incoming putney train then looking over her shoulder nodded her head shyly and ran forward to join bindle who was standing at the entrance of a first-class carriage as she entered the carriage bindle stepped back to charlie dixon you just make all your plans young feller he said let me know the day and she'll be there charlie dixon gripped bindle's hand bindle winced and drew up one leg in obvious pain at the heartiness of the young lover's grasp there are times young feller when i wish i was your enemy he said as he gazed ruefully at his knuckles your friendship hurts like hell End of chapter 13 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com